Sunday evening to y'all. Welcome inside the FamilyDeal.com 7 Sports Cave. I am your host, Justin Rose. Tonight's show, we're talking Michigan. We're talking Michigan State. Of course, we're talking about those Wisconsin Badgers. The Lions, they're on the road. Big Monday night showdown with the Packers tomorrow. We'll go in depth with all of that coming up later on throughout this show. But let's just get started with what's going on across Lake Michigan out in Green Bay. The Lions have touched down earlier today. They're getting set for tomorrow's Monday night showdown with those Packers. Now, Deshaun Hand, he did practice this week, but he's ruled out for the game. We do have good news on the injury front, though. That guy, TJ Hawkinson, will, cl has cleared concussion protocol, and he will be active for the game. How much he'll play? To be determined. Matt Patricia said this week they'll continue to monitor Hawkinson during the game, should he play, of course, to make sure he stays healthy. Now, as we get closer to kickoff, our man on the ground, Brad Galley, in Green Bay for our coverage, which we'll get to later on in this show. He has some more of the storylines heading into tomorrow night. Here's what we know about Green Bay every single year. It's probably going to be cold, and there's a ton of people here who love this football team. As we arrived in Green Bay, we saw what the Lions saw in their flight. Snow, a little bit of sleet, and then sunshine. That's what's to come Monday night. The temperatures on Sunday dropping below 40 degrees. Carrion Johnson played in Alabama grew up, played at Auburn, and said all of those NFL films memories of guys seeing their own breath playing in this game at Lambeau between two division rivals, yeah, not for him, but he's going to get a heavy dose of it, and the Lions will need him after his 100-yard performance against the Kansas City Chiefs. Matthew Stafford, this will be his 11th Monday night football game. He's less concerned about the division rivalry and the Monday night light spotlights. He wants to be first place in this division. It's going to be a, you know, a a fun atmosphere you know Monday night will be a, a whole bunch of fun um, we'll have some young guys that I'm sure first time playing on Monday night we'll, we'll remember it for a long time at Lambeau it's pretty cool for them. The opportunity to play on Monday night football it, it's a special thing it's fun playing at home obviously it's, it's better it's long days Sunday and Monday for sure um, but uh, in a short week the following week but it is always special playing on Monday night football. It says a lot about what Matthew Stafford has done this season he's been earning a ton of praise and this week no exception He's about to become the fastest player ever to 40,000 passing yards, a full section in the free press laying out stories from former wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, and even Taylor Decker, who he threw a touchdown pass to. The praise hasn't stopped there. Carson Palmer called Stafford the most athletic quarterback he's ever seen. Barry Sanders, we talked with him one-on-one -on -one at Ford Field this week for a community event. The praise for Stafford continued. You're the face of this franchise for as long as the franchise goes on. Matthew Stafford's the face of this team right now. What do you make of him as a quarterback? What's the ceiling for this team with him at the helm? Well, again, I think we're off to a great start. I think um, I think he's one of those guys that, from, from my perspective, is very well respected around the league. Um, and I think it's kind of similar to when I played. It's that you know when you play against him that you're in for a dogfight, that the Lions aren't the rollover team anymore. They could beat anybody. And so I think those are some of the similarities I think of. When my career, in my career, and when I think of Matt, that they're 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 playing a real NFL player who's elite, um, you know. So, so uh, you know, that's I think another reason why we're very excited about the season. Stafford was pretty insightful coming out of the bye week. He was asked if it's a good thing or a bad thing to have it so early in the season. Having been in the league now for 11 seasons, Stafford said it really doesn't matter when the bye week comes. It's how you perform afterwards. If you win, then it came at a great time. If you lose, then everybody says. Boy, that really came at the wrong time. Matthew Stafford has 34 career touchdown passes against the Green Bay Packers. That's tied with Johnny Unitas for the most ever against Green Bay. One more, and he's the top dog in that category. But for now, Stafford is just looking to be the top dog in the NFC North. In Green Bay with the Lions, Brad Galley, 7 Action Sports. Yeah, I just call him Matthew Socrates Stafford. Of course, we'll be airing the game right here on WXYZ. But before kickoff, join me, Herman Moore, on set to help preview the game. Brad, of course, will be providing coverage from the field at Lambeau Field. That kicks off 7 o'clock Monday night showdown, the game right after that. All right, let's talk a little college football now. Michigan staying put in the latest AP poll, 16th. But the next two weeks will really tell us exactly where the Wolverines belong. This week, they'll visit 7th-ranked Penn State. Saturday night, a whiteout in Happy Valley. That'll be played right here on WXYZ as well. Certainly a tough atmosphere to handle, but the offense trying to continue to find its groove, especially after a nice 42-point outburst against Illinois yesterday. 
Uh, our mindset was, you know, run the ball down their throats, you know, and we did that, and you know, just keep keep carrying the rock, you feel me, and just like get as many yards as we can. You know? and that's always that's the focus on every game. I think we showed a lot of resilience as a team, um, just like we have earlier on in the year, and um, I think that's going to be a characteristic that's that's similar with us throughout the year. As for Michigan State, ugh, their bye week comes at a crucial time. They had absolutely no answers after getting absolutely dismantled by Wisconsin on Saturday. But one reporter decided to try and see if Mark D'Antonio had any regrets about shuffling his coaching staff in the offseason instead of firing and hiring some new people. Well, I don't think you talk. I don't think we ask those questions right now. We're six, seven, seven games into the schedule. I think that's sort of a dumbass question, to be quite honest with you. We're not there yet. That's what it tells me. We're not there. We should be. We've got some very good players, but we're not there. Not, not in the last two weeks. So we've got to recollect things. We've got to buy a week. We've got to recollect ourselves and, um, and push forward. A little bit of spiciness coming from the head coach over in East Lansing. We'll dive into his comments and much more about both Michigan and Michigan State coming up next. Darian Harris, former Michigan State linebacker, he's in studio. So is Michael Spath from WTKA Radio. We'll talk with those guys coming up next here on thefamilydeal.com. 7 Sports Cave, back in a minute. Welcome back to thefamilydeal.com, 7 Sports Cave. Now it's time to dive into this college football that we have right now. Michael Spath from WTKA Radio is here. Darian Harris, former Michigan State linebacker, to break it all down. Let's start with the Wolverines. They're still in the top 25 in the AP for now. It'll be tested, certainly, the next two weeks. Going to Penn State this weekend, home against Notre Dame next weekend. They are both two top 10 opponents. But let's talk first about what they just did against the Illini. Michael, you said you were watching this game with a cold beverage in your hand, and uh -huh. I feel like everybody else out there kind of had to do the same come the third quarter. Yeah, it wasn't a pretty quarter for Michigan. I mean, they, they gave 25 unanswered points to an Illinois team that I remarked during the first quarter, first quarter and a half of football on Saturday, I thought Illinois should have been a Division II football team. I mean, they looked as bad as Rutgers. They looked like, I mean, Michigan was, was just gashing them on the ground. And I thought this is going to be a 62 to nothing type of game. And then Illinois came back. And is it, was it a byproduct of Illinois? Certainly, as Darren would tell you. I mean, no team goes off on that type of run without them uh, producing a lot of those points. But a lot of it was like symptomatic of Michigan's problems this year. Offense goes into a huge lull. Defense has some letdowns. And it caused a lot of panic among Michigan fans because, as you said, the real season is just about to begin. Darian, when you watch Michigan play and you've seen kind of the ups and the downs that they've had this year, especially against Illinois, is that a factor of them maybe thinking, well, we're up 28 nothing, <laughs> we can pack this up and go home? Is that, does that trickle in even on good teams? Yeah, I think so. I think that's kind of something that's naturally tricks in. Even if you're a big-time athlete, you know, everybody talks about you can't take any opponent lightly. You got to understand they all count one. You got to go out there and still execute. They got guys on scholarship, too. I mean, you can go down all the cliches, but eventually sometimes human age is going to kick in. You know, I think that the game might have gone a little different if Brandon Peters played. I think that maybe for Illinois, but also for Michigan, they would have come out like world right. beaters and understood what was on the line, understood what the talk was going to be. When you lose that aspect of the game and you come out and you jump up 28 nothing, you got guys running Illinois defenders over. It looks like it's a mismatch. I agree. I mean, it was like Illinois, Rutgers, and then everybody else in the Big Ten is like light years ahead of these two teams. But then you see Illinois start to come back, and it is. It is a little bit of a byproduct of they do have guys on scholarships too. They do have Lovey Smith there. He is a big-time coach. They do have a great coaching staff. But at the end of the day, you got to look up at what Michigan was doing. They just did not execute in the second half like they were in the first half. And when you let a team like Illinois back in there at the end in the fight, they had opportunities to come back and win that football game. They just weren't able to make it happen. I give Michigan a lot of credit, and people are going to be like, well, it's Illinois and whatever. Like, but in that moment, the offense went right down the field, scored a touchdown to, take the, uh, to really kind of seize momentum back. The defense forced two fumbles, including one where they, you know, they coughed it up, caught it on the goal line, and almost went and scored. And so they outscored them 14 0 and really, they really like reasserted themselves. So I think that was a positive sign for Michigan. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to take it as that. I mean, a win is a win at the end of the day. I remember my senior year, we're playing Purdue. We're up 21 0 at halftime. The final score of that game was 24-21. Mm. Obviously, there was something different yeah. that happened in the second half, but you know what? You pull off the win, you go on with the rest of the season. So sometimes we consider those kind of trap games. I think it's a little bit more of like a bear trap game if it's Illinois. You don't 
expect, expect them to be able yeah. to compete. But they came out there and, and they wanted it. They wanted yeah. it more than Michigan did in the second half. But I agree, you do have to give them credit for finishing the game, getting the win, so now they can focus on next week. It, it certainly does speak to Shea Patterson's maybe leadership and some of the other guys offensively to, to kind of get together and go, guys, this is a big drive if we go out, stub our toe, three and out. And, and whether the coaching calls on the field made a difference or not they executed when they had to execute to put that game out of reach but we have to talk about why they put themselves in that scenario in the first place the turnovers mm -hmm. just killing michigan this year what why are they not fixing that well i mean certainly they're trying to fix it right i mean darren will tell you here in a second like when you're at practice, the coaches don't 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 walk in there and be like, hey, you know, carry <laughs> the ball loosely. Yeah. 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 Like they're nonstop telling those guys to like, carry it close. Like they're going through drills, they're they're putting them through the rigors. It's it's just uh, one of those things where momentum seems to be against Michigan. Uh, and I think when you've when you've got guys, I'm I don't know, fumbles are weird. Like, but 17 fumbles this year. They haven't lost all of them. But something is going on, and whether it's in their heads or they see one guy drop it to the turf, and the next thing, like everybody's kind of like worrying about it. I can't explain it. I've never seen anything like this. And they only lost a couple of them yesterday. If they would have lost one more, they might have lost that football game yesterday. We're halfway through the season at this point. I mean, you got to believe that one of the game plans is going against Michigan's offense is hit the ball. Yeah. Tackle well, and hit the ball. If you can rally people to the football, as, as Darian knows, playing defense, I mean, if you can get like three or three guys, then one of those guys can just go right for the ball. He can try to punch it out. He can try to put his helmet on it. Because you don't have to worry about, like, hey, if I miss this, the guy's going for a big gain. If I got two other teammates right there, and I think that's what you're seeing a lot of in football right now is just the railing of the football and then knowing, like, we can, I can take a shot at this. And right now, every single time they take a shot at it, it seems to be working against Michigan. Jim Harbaugh made some headlines saying that the offense was hitting its stride before the Illinois game, and everyone was kind of like, you watching the same game that we're all watching? They did at times this year. Give me the stride meter where is Michigan oh on the offensive stridometer, Michael, as we enter Are we a talking huge on a, week? On a 10 scale, I think they're like a, maybe like a 5. So halfway uh, to the Yeah, I mean, you, you never know what you're going to get. It's like they could, they could ball out and look great on one drive, and the next drive go three and out, turn the ball over. Uh, this is a, a rough random game for, for, this Mich for Jim Harbaugh because of the, the record on the road against ranked opponents. One and six so far in his career. This is a referendum game for Shea Patterson because the fan base is is pulling the seams apart right now. Some of them really want Dylan McCaffrey. Some of them are arguing for Joe Milton. He's got to prove to not only the fans, but he's got to prove to his teammates and prove to himself and prove to his coaches that he's the quarterback that can lead Michigan to greater success. It's a referendum game for wide receivers and running backs. Time to make some plays, guys, and for the offensive line. And, Hey, let's talk about the defense, too. I mean, yeah, it's right. a rough running game for Go everybody right now. Group. This is This is a game where Michigan either says, take us seriously, and, you know, Wisconsin was bad, but don't write us off. We're going to make some noise here in November. Or it's a game where everybody just says, they are what they, we think they are, and that's just not a very good football team. Who wins it? Both of you. Who do you think? Penn State. Do you think Penn State's going to win Penn State at home, under the lights, college game days there. This is a scenario that's like a nightmare scenario for Michigan, and, I'll, I'll say this, I will give them a ton of credit. If they win this game, I don't care if they win it, you know, 18 to 17, 2 to 1. They win this football game and there will be praise for Michigan and they'll rightfully have earned it, but I don't, I don't see it happening. Yep. Think, yep, think Penn State wins, but I think it's going to be close. I think it'll be a close one. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing if Michigan can get punched in the mouth, which they will in the beginning of that game and kind of survive it, like a bobber and fishing. Goes down a little bit, but yeah. they come back up and bounce back because I haven't really seen that from them in they the They didn't do it against Notre Dame. These big games. They didn't do it against Ohio State last year. They didn't do it against Wisconsin this year. The only time they won a road game in the last couple of years uh, against ranked opponent was Michigan State, mm -hmm. and that was last year, and that's a little bit different because of like how close those two teams are and right. the geography and the whole thing. But, no, this is a, a big moment. If they're down 14 nothing after the first quarter, that's, they just can't put themselves in that situation again. Yeah, no, they can't. They didn't bounce back against the shell of a program, Florida, either, yeah. by the way. <laughs> just wanted to bring that out there. Yeah, thanks. Speaking of let's a shell of a program, let's talk about a shell of a program. Mark D'Antonio has some really, really interesting comments after the Wisconsin loss. We're going to dive into that coming up next, though. Oh, boy, here we go. Uh -huh. Coming up next, though, stay with us. Welcome back to the Family Deal 7 Sports Cave. Guys, Michigan State felt the same wrath that Michigan felt at Camp Randall earlier this season. And I really feel like the fan bases are 
reacting very similar to the dismantling that the Badgers did. Let's start by saying this. I think we all can sit back in our easy chairs and go, Wisconsin's a pretty good football yeah, team yeah. this year. Now, can they beat Ohio State? That is yet to be determined. But as far as being, Well, they're going to get two opportunities. They're probably yeah. going to get two opportunities unless Penn State can do something about that. Um, but look, Wisconsin played great. That's great. But I remember watching the first half, and I think they had 38 total yards of offense. 38 total yards of offense. And I said, yes, that is certainly execution. But coaching has to have an impact when you can't move the ball right. Darian, what did you see from that first half alone? And the, obviously the second half took care of itself, but this game was lost by halftime. Yeah, it was. I mean, I just saw a Michigan State team that was at, outmatched really in all facets of the game. I mean, maybe the only thing that you point to that Michigan State did well really was, was stop the run. I mean, they, they did stop the run. They, they slowed Jonathan Taylor down. Now, it wasn't one of those. That's a win. 30 yards. It is a win. You would think it would translate to a win on the scoreboard. It didn't. Uh, the offense, they couldn't get anything rolling. They couldn't get the running game going. I mean, Brian Lewerke's uh, stats were, were not uh, akin to what he's done the entire season. There was the usual drops uh, that we've seen that's leading the country, which you can't have right. from the receivers. And then I agree. I mean, the coaching has to come into play. You've got to be able to find something to get your offense rolling. So it was just an entire uh, just montage of everybody not doing the right thing. And then and in the game, obviously, Coach D comes out and says, as the head man, I have to take responsibility, uh, which is exactly what he should say. And he's also added to that saying, we're not there. And he didn't even really say yet. He just said, we're not yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And I think that while he doesn't often give a ton away in pressers and different things of the media, he's not a big media guy, he also does leave some Easter eggs with what he says. And I think he's being pretty honest, saying, hey, we, don't have the, we don't have the horses yeah. this year. I mean, how much do you look at that roster and say they aren't where they need to be? I think when we're talking about them not having the horses, that's what we're missing. It's the offensive line that they're missing and being able to roll. The defense is there, obviously. The secondary is a little young and struggling a little bit, but the defense is there. We knew they were going to come in and be one of the top defenses in the country. Certainly after the first week against Tulsa, negative 74 rush yards, you think oh, this is going to be the best defense in the history of Michigan State. Haven't necessarily proved to be that, but it's still there. But again, I just point back to, to missing the guys on the offensive line that can get you rolling. If you have an O-line that can simply move people out of the way, you can do things. You saw this movie before. Yeah. The, the, the team getting beat was just wearing different colors. I mean, <laughs> as you're, you, you kind of like look back as this weekend unfolds, you see Michigan State's outcry on Twitter and, ah, oh, coaching this, Antonio's done. Like, what's your take of the state of the Spartans right now? I, every time I hear people talking about D'Antonio, this has got to be his last year, move on from D'Antonio, I'm like, God, best coach in the history of the program. And they just want to throw him out. At the same time, I know that the offseason, there was an opportunity to make a lot of changes. And he made a lot of subtle changes to the staff. And that's really upset a lot of Michigan State fans because they feel like they're running, similar to Michigan, a little bit of an antiquated system. They, they haven't really adapted to what college football is today. All their stresses, the play at the quarterback position, at the running back spot, everything has happened because they haven't put together one of their, best, one of their better offensive lines. And, you know, Michigan fans came into the year thinking this was going to be one of our best offensive lines, and they've struggled. And so you don't have those five guys up front that are just mauling people and getting it done. That's what Wisconsin has right now. That's what Ohio State has right now. And those are what, that's why those two teams are the best programs in the Big Ten. Look, I think I'm starting to shift towards Michigan State has to really take a serious, serious look at itself. Who do they want to be, not just the rest of this season, but going forward? Because... Darren, where are you at with this? Because every time I watch them go out and put a, a lackluster effort, and look, yes, the bar has been set high, but that's what happens when you win championships, yeah. people. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. and no disrespect to what Harbaugh is doing. I still think the best days of Harbaugh are in front of us. I really do. But D'Antonio's been there. So when you don't get there and you go back down and people are starting to fringe on this, oh, are we a 7-5 and five football team every year? Are we 8-4? and four? That's freaky to a lot of fans. Yeah. Calm them down or jump on the ship where it's sinking, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you I know. Me. I'm, I'm kind of hovering in the middle. You know, it's, it's crazy because I, I, I agree. That's what happens when you've had this success. But I think that it's also a situation where I'm not sure. And, and again, I'm, I was new to the party. You know, I'm not from the state, came from out of state, got introduced to Big Ten football, got indoctrinated into this rivalry and all that stuff. So what happened before, I just heard like horror stories. And it, it was to the point where I don't think people even believed that we were going to ever be as good as we were. That 36 and five stretch over three years. It was I mean, unbelievable. It, exactly. So once you do that, it does. It sets your bar high, it sets your expectations high. Now it's how do you maintain and sustain that? Michigan State hasn't been able to do that. 
I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think it's a combination of not adjusting to the times. You know, I, I'm a young guy. I'm a young coach right now. I love when, when there's youth on coaching staffs. So I think that's missing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a coordinator or even a position coach. Just having some type of youth mm -hmm. with a say-so so that you have somebody that can relate to the players. I think that's important. But then also it's players going out there and being willing to play. I, you got to see the effort. And when I'm texting the guys that I played with, when we're in our group chats, that's what we're not seeing is just that effort and that want to and that, that dog and that mentality. I think most of the guys have it. It's just about going out and putting it out there on the field. The leadership's there. I know those four captains. They're all phenomenal leaders. Mm -hmm. Worky, Bocce, Willikis, Williams, and then the rest of the Eagle Council, they got the leadership council. They're right. phenomenal leaders. Other guys on the team have to want to be led. You can either lead or respond to leadership. That's what Coach Manny always told us. You have to want to be led. You have to want to understand that you're not playing as well as you need to be. you got to take the criticism from outside and within and then go out on the field and just give an effort. So you get this bye week and then you have Penn State. We just want to see competition. We just want to see you compete against Penn State. It's not really about the wins and losses to me. It's just about seeing guys compete. I understand the frustration because we're a society that lives like in the moment all the time. We'll see what uh, both teams end up doing. I know this, that Michigan-Michigan State game later on in the year is going to uh, decide a lot <laughs> such an for these coaches. And the these, oh. It's going to be so interesting. Guys, thank you guys both for being here so much. <sighs> Let's take a breath. Let's take a breath, shall we? All right. We'll be back with them later on in the season, of course, to wrap up. Maybe we'll have you guys back on for that preview show for that Michigan-Michigan State game. Coming up next, though, some final thoughts here on the FamilyDeal.com 7 Sports Game Studios. All right, time for our high school football game of the week. The football season flying by. It's week eight. Time to take a look at the nominees for our Leo's Coney Island game of the week. Lake Orion at Clarkston. Utica Eisenhower, Macomb, Dakota. Monroe, St. Mary's Catholic. Central versus Monroe Jefferson. Detroit Public Safety Academy versus Pontiac Notre Dame Prep. Birmingham Groves and Birmingham Seaholm voting runs through Wednesday at midnight, WXYZ.com. And of course, I will be at that game for 5 and 6 o'clock with highlights at 11. That is our show for this week. Have yourself a good one. We'll see you next week.